Oh, hey, I didn't see you there. <laughs> no. Yo, we're back with another episode of Walkie Talkie. I got the homie Dustin here, and this kind of feels familiar because Dustin, we've done this before. Yep, yep. About two years ago? Two years ago. You were the very first Walkie Talkie, and now you're the very first part two Walkie Talkie. I'm back. Can you reintroduce yourself for those who have not watched that first episode? My name is Dustin. Uh, I live in Brooklyn. Uh, I'm a photographer. I've kind of moved a little bit away from street. Still doing it though. Uh, we'll see how today goes. I'm using a large format camera today, so we'll see how it goes. Cool. All right. Let's let's. Uh, we're in Prospect Park right now. Um, this is your neighborhood, and this is kind of what you've been uh, a big part of your. Work. Recent, yeah, recent work, yeah. Yeah, so let's we're gonna do that today, and then we might hit the streets later on. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's go over by. Maybe I'll take a picture of that ladder. Oh, it's about as fast as I reload my M6 as well. Sometimes I just set it up and look through the ground glass, and that's when I decide if I'm gonna take a picture or not, and. A lot of times I don't. <laughs> this is a um, 300 millimeter Nikkor W 5.6. It's uh, equivalent to like on 35 millimeter. It's equivalent to like a 40 millimeter or like 42 millimeter. Uh, doesn't really translate perfectly, but it's like a normal, normal lens. The crazy thing about it is the fastest shutter speed on it is 1 25th. These cameras are kind of, um, obviously very large. So you kind of have to pre-visualize a lot because you don't want to just be moving it around. So I'm kind of, I'm thinking about a frame uh, as I'm looking and where I roughly want things in the scene. Um, and then it's really important, or I like to straighten out the camera. So it's got these bubble levels on top, make sure it's level. That just keeps everything into perspective so you don't have to crop later. So yeah, straighten out the perspectives and I'm kind of thinking about it. And then I'm thinking like, do I want it portrait or landscape? Cause you can take this piece off. You can flip it either way. I'm thinking portrait. And then you need the dark cloth cause you can't really see anything without that. Uh, and now I'm gonna go away for a second. There you go. <laughs> ah. One of the things I really like about the view camera and specifically the eight x 10 is uh, there's movements. So the front of the lens is uh, how you manipulate focus. In and out, that's gonna determine your focus, but the focus plane will be level with the image plane. If you tilt the lens, you're shifting the focus plane. So now your plane of focus is not parallel. So you can kind of be more selective with what you focus on. Tilting the lens, uh, you can also shift the lens from side to side, rise and fall. And when you swing the lens this way or this way, you can change the perspective also this way. So you can change the plane of focus kind of anywhere in here, which makes it really fun. Uh, you know, I could focus on if I was standing sideways, I could focus on both eyes, all sorts of different things. But that's one of the reasons I like um, the view camera specifically eight by 10. I like it because looking at the ground glass on the back is just like really magical. But also the image that you get out of it is like just really magical. You get like, uh, you can get the same angle of view. So even though this is a 300 millimeter, it acts like a 40 millimeter because your image surface is so much larger. So it's a 300 millimeter lens. The angle of view is similar to like a 40 millimeter, but you can get the depth of field as a, the same as like a 300 millimeter. So it just creates a really unique look that's, uh, you can't really manipulate or you can't recreate uh, with any other medium. How many times do you set up for a photo like this and then just end up not? <laughs> Most times. <laughs> is that because of the, the film prices or like what's the reason behind just setting it up and going? Nah. A lot of times it's like, is it a strong image? Like, what is it? What is it saying? Is it is it visually interesting? Is the light good? I'm in my own head a lot. And when I'm walking around like without a camera, I'm constantly looking at light. I'm making pictures in my head like all the time. And sometimes those pictures, even though I think they're going to be interesting, they're they're just not. Um, and the cool thing about ground glasses, you can really see what you're going to get. 
Um, and sometimes I think a, th a thing is going to be interesting. <laughs> it's just it's just not after I look at it. Um, that same with street too. You know, sometimes you see a, a piece of something interesting, and you instinctually just want to like grab it and take a photo. And you know, as you probably know, the hit rate is very low with street photography. Um, with this being more meditative and slow, uh, the hit rate is higher, but that just means that sometimes I'm not actually taking the photo. Uh, but I think I might take this. It's kind of interesting. This ladder is not here. I walk the same route like all the time. This ladder's never been here. As I do this routine of walking around the park in the same loop, uh, I try to notice the subtle things that change, whether it's something that people left behind, the light on something that wasn't like that yesterday or the, the next day. Um, just trying to find these subtle differences because I've been out here for like a year and a half taking photos. <laughs> a lot of it's the same. So trying to find the differences. Yeah, I might take this photo, which I'll go grab the film. Shooting all black and white, that's primarily an economic choice. Color film for 8x10 is extremely expensive. I think a 10 pack of Portra 400 is uh, like over $300. So that's $30 a shot. Uh, that's just not sustainable. And I want to have a body of work. So, you know, that'd be so much money. So black and white's much cheaper. I think it comes out to about like, depending on the film, five to $8 a shot, which is not crazy. What are you developing it now? I develop at home and scan at home for eight by 10. Yeah, it's a slow process. I can only do two sheets at a time. Um, so the process for me taking a photo, in case we don't take another one today, we'll see. But the process is, you know, pre-visualize, set up, decide, you know, portrait or landscape, set up the camera, level it out, focus. Once the camera is focused, you put in the, the film holder. The front of the lens is always open so that you can focus. Then you would do a light meter reading, figure out what the light is, change your f-stop shutter speed accordingly. Then you have to shut the lens because it's just a hole right now. So you shut it and then you would cock the lens, take a dry photo without filming it just to make sure the shutter is working because mistakes are costly. You put in the film and remove the dark side, take the photo. But I'm going to focus a little bit more because I'm probably going to use a little bit of movements to try to get the ladder super sharp. So might be boring, but I'll be happy. That's what you're using, you're using this thing for the focus. Oh yeah, yeah, This is um, a loop. It's just a magnifier so that when I go under there, you know, you're looking at an image the size of a sheet of paper. You pick where you want to be in focus and then you can use this to kind of like zoom in and make sure it's in focus. But yeah, I'm gonna go under here for a minute. So it's in focus now to how I want it. I'm gonna make sure everything's tightened down and then do a light meter reading. If I'm doing a portrait, I usually go a little quicker than this because especially when I'm asking people, random people that I find, I don't want to take up too much of their time. But for something like this, I kind of take my time. Uh, I like to shoot, there's kind of two schools of thought when it comes to <laughs> large format. Some people like to shoot, um, so that everything is in focus, which you can do pretty easily with these cameras. And some people like to do really selective focus, so you have a lot of background blur. I kind of like that aspect. I'm trying to make this park feel a little bit not like a park. I'm trying to find like ethereal moments or like things that just feel different than a normal park. So I like the really wide open thing because it lets you know that you're in, like the setting that you're in, but it also kind of like adds some mystery, I guess. So this shot's at five, six, at 30th of a second, but I'm gonna bump it to F8 at 15th of a second. Close the lens, cut the shutter, put the film in. Do a dry shutter. All right, and it's ready to go. Take out the dark slide. Make sure that nothing's in the way. All right, three, two, one. And that's it. A lot of buildup for very anticlimactic. It's a lot of stuff. Kids don't get into large format. I used to feel so self-conscious carrying this thing around just because like everyone looks at you. <laughs> 
But in some ways it's actually really nice because it's a good icebreaker. If you wanna take a portrait um, of somebody, most people haven't had their portrait taken on a camera like this. So it's a nice little introduction or icebreaker. Can you talk a little bit about your path to this camera in large format? Let's see, I went to art school in Denver. I took a photo history class and that really changed my worldview of photography. I'd always thought of photography kind of as like a, a means to maybe make money or almost like as a product, like fashion photography, things like that. I never really thought of it in the art sense. And I learned about Gary Winogrand and that really like shook my world up. That got me into um, street photography. And I wanted to be like all the people I looked up to, uh, looked up to. So I bought a film camera. I bought like a, this was like 2000, eight or nine, I bought a Contax T2 for $250, which if you don't know, that camera is like crazy expensive now. But I used it for a year, I sold it. I bought a Leica M6 and that started my path like on film photography and street photography. Someone showed me Alex Soth's work and this was just honestly just a few years ago. So uh, I'm a little late to it, but someone showed me his work and it's all eight by 10 or most of it's eight by 10 and I just fell in love with the look and the portraits that he was getting and did a deeper dive into other large format photographers and really, you know, after internet research, found that you really can't get the look any other way. Not only the look, but the interaction between the sitter or the subject and the photographer is prolonged. So you have a longer time with them and it just creates new experiences and new, it's a new way to take photos. Um, even if you're not taking pictures of people, it's a more meditative process and you have to think more about it and be more selective. You know, I can't shoot a hundred photos at any given time. So I just, it's forced me to be more selective and I really liked that aspect of it. It's part of what I like about film in general, but the larger you go, the more you have to be selective like that. I don't know, I got a four by five to try it out. I loved it, but I was always flirting with the idea of getting an, a bigger camera. And then I did, and I, I really haven't looked back to four by five at all. The ground glass on eight by 10, it's just like, it's just a different experience. They're very similar cameras and how they work, but there's something about it. I just, I, I really like eight by 10. So it's a very long winded answer, but it's kind of, it's how I got here, I guess. I remember you had mentioned like, when you had the four by five, you had kind of gone back to medium format for a little bit because yeah. you you had felt like the difference wasn't as drastic and you don't like, there's kind of no reason to shoot the four by five if you can get a similar look with a medium format camera yeah. or something to that tune. The four by five, it definitely, I mean, if you're using the movements of a view camera, four by five is going to look different than like a six by seven medium format. But the way I use it, uh, I don't use a ton of movements uh, if I don't have to. And yeah, I got a Mamiya 7 and it felt like the images I was getting was like close enough to the four by five that I just didn't see really the point <laughs> in all the time it took. But I think eight by 10, you can't, I, uh, nothing touches it in, in my, in my mind, it's very different. Although I will say I've been, I, I got a GFX camera and if you use a really fast lens with that, you can get some really cool looks. A lot of the park work has been done with, with that camera as well. So you, you just talked about Alex Soth and how he was kind of, uh, served as kind of the impetus to start your research into large format or larger formats and eventually the 8x10. Who were some of the other lar large format photographers or bodies of work that you were kind of looking at at that time? Oh man, there's a lot and I have such a terrible memory, but um, the ones that come to mind right away are Andrea Modica. She's probably one of my favorites. She's got a lot of great books. Treadwell is really good. Um, I think the other one's called As We Wait. Another photographer is Barbara Bosworth. She's also an eight by 10 photographer and uh, she's awesome. I mean, early influences, Joel Sternfeld, um, Joel Meyerowitz, Cape Light is awesome. There's, there's, there's so many. And then when you go into four by five, there's even more, but those are, those are probably the biggest ones. Uh, Andrea probably being one of the biggest, Alex Soth as well, um, Bob, Barbara Bosworth. A lot of this whole project stemmed out of 
me feeling like I wanted to change from like the city backdrop. And this is my front yard. I live across the street from the park. And uh, I was, I guess, craving home. I'm from Colorado and nature is a big part of my, my upbringing. So I don't know, something about this park in particular. It's different than Central Park. It's, uh, it's a little bit more lonesome. It's not as touristy at all. A lot of locals and it's a lot quieter. And I really didn't want to like make a project about Prospect Park. It was really just me trying to get away from the city a little bit. And this is the closest and easiest place to get to for me. Uh, I kind of kept coming here because at least I can try to talk to people and get portraits. That was a big part of it too is with street photography, you can do street portraiture, but I, I don't know, there's something about it. I feel like I'm entering, interrupting people's days. Um, you know, a lot of people in the city are on their way somewhere, but in a park, people are usually hanging out or doing something in the park and it's a little bit less difficult to interrupt someone. Coming here started as, you know, a place that's right, right outside my front door, that's not the city and I could practice portraits. And then it kind of turned into something more and I'm not really sure what that is yet. Uh, you know, it started with me trying to talk to people and get portraits and then slowly I started taking pictures of trees and things left behind in the park, like ribbons, clothing. I don't know, I'm kind of just following my intuition and I don't really know. I'm a very intuitive photographer. I think that comes from like years of shooting street photography. It's just kind of, let's see, see what this is, I don't know. I don't have a big agenda or it's not very conceptual. It's purely driven by like what interests me. There, you know, there's a lot of people here, but I am very selective with who I ask to take a photo. There's gotta be something about it. And I don't know how to put it into words even. I'll try to go ask, but it's scary. It's hard to talk to people. And you know, if they're reading a book or something, you gotta go interrupt them and, hey, sorry, <laughs> can I take your photo? So we'll see if that happens today, but yeah. What's usually your like rejection rate? Uh, most people say yes. It's usually the photos that I really want that people say no. Do you feel like you've gotten better at approaching people over the course of the past year and a half? <sighs> yes and no. I feel like a lot of it comes in waves of my confidence. My confidence goes up, up and down. And if I can start the day with one yes, that usually lends to a really good day of taking portraits. Um, but it's all about getting that first person to say yes and uh, just going up to them. That's the hardest part is like approaching someone because you're asking for, you're kind of asking for a lot when you're taking a photo and especially with something like this, you know, it's gonna take five, 10 minutes maybe. Um, so you're kind of asking for a lot and at least it feels like it. The initial ask and walking up, sometimes I'll circle something like I'll see somebody and I'll walk past it and I have to like talk myself into the, all right, go back, just do it. What's the worst they can say? Like, gotta kind of remind myself, like nothing bad's gonna happen. They just might say no. Before, when, when it came to, at least when it came to street photography, and I'm not sure this is applicable for um, what you're doing here, we ranked, and you, I think you did this in a Q and A video, but you ranked elements of a photo. You break a photo down, it's usually like you know, composition, light, and moment. I think for me, if I have to rank it, it's moment is most important for me, uh, then composition, then light. Um, moment, composition, then light. How does that change or even does it change when it comes to what you're doing now? Whew. Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, the goal is to get all three, right? If you have to rank them with large format, composition becomes a lot more crucial. Moment is still very important, but I think it becomes less important because you're kind of fabricating the moment in a way, like you're able to build the picture differently. You're not having to find it, you can kind of create it. I think I'd actually probably almost reverse it. So I think composition, then light, then moment, which feels weird to say. I haven't really thought about it like that. It's almost, I don't wanna say impossible, but like really difficult to capture the moment when you're carrying around the camera like that. Like there's no like candid moments. Right. It's... I've done it. Yeah, I have a couple, but it's like stationary people that are like not doing anything. They don't know I'm doing it, but you can kind of get to the moment. A lot of times what I'll do is I'll set it up. 
frame it, I'll find the composition that I want, and then I'll ask the subject to like either recreate what I saw when I walked up to them, or if it's someone that I know or something, I'll have them like play in a certain way, like, oh, put your hands, you know, do something interesting with your hands, like, you know, intertwine them somehow. And people are often more creative than I am, so like they'll just do something and I'll wait until they've kind of done something that's interesting. I'm like, wait, that, you know, and I'll like try to pause them in that moment. I think the hardest part with large format is the expression because you're getting, you're giving them so much time to be self-critical about themselves and how they look in front of the camera. And you want to try to like comfort them and like, you know, you want to get it right. But I think that's where I struggle the most is um, getting people to give an expression that feels kind of authentic or real or even just neutral. Because sometimes you can tell when people are just really stiff and they're, they feel uncomfortable. Patrick, how are you? It's going good. It's going good. It's good to see you too. I got the big camera today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, could I take your photo? I know I already have one of you, but I've never done it with this. Would that be all right? Okay. For the project? Is that all right? Okay. It'll take just a couple minutes. Is that okay? Cool. I didn't see you out here the last time I was here. I feel like I see you every time. Oh, hot under there. Uh, nope, sorry, Once, if you go back, it takes just a couple minutes. I'll tell you when I'm done. Is that how you wanna sit? Cause you have to hold real still, just like that. Keep holding still. All right, if I could get you to look right here. Three, two, one. Great, all done. Now I'm all done. No, thank you, Patrick. It's good to see you when I first got um, my four by five. He was one of the first portraits I asked for out here. Super nice guy. I see him out here all the time. I always say hi. There's actually quite a few people that are like here and in the same spots like every day. Cause I come out, I'd say on average three to four times a week doing this, this kind of loop. But sometimes if I'm really sick of going to the city, I'm out here like every day. So you get to know some of the people who are like regulars, similar to like Midtown, right? Like you see a lot of the same characters. I think the best thing someone can do if they want to grow is find a photographer that they look up to that is open to doing like one-on-one -on -one sessions. I think I've learned the most with, um, like not to name drop, but about every two to three months, I meet up with Andrea Modica. She's one of my favorite photographers. I meet up with her and I have her review my work and kind of give me feedback on what she thinks is working, isn't working, where the work's going and just overall feedback. And she's been like super helpful in learning, helping me learn how to compose images better. Cause I think because I came from street as my primary photographic exploration, <laughs> I was less concerned with composition. It was more about moment like we were just talking about with eight by 10 or or just portraits in general, or more intentional photography where you're, you're slowing down, you're taking a very uh, pointed picture. You have to think about composition more in the sense of if you want people to view it at, a, at the same level that you're hoping it to be viewed. I don't know, I'm, I'm wording that wrong, but if I want someone that I look up to, to look, to, to like my work, there's things that she can help me with understanding. Cause I didn't, I don't have a formal education for photography. You know, she helps me look, she's helped me learn to like look at the edges of my frame a lot more. I've never really paid too much attention. It's like, oh, did I get the picture of the thing? Great. But she's like, cool, you got the picture of the thing, but you know, you messed up all these other things or you didn't mess it up, but they could be improved on. <laughs> Picture, picture. Huh? What? Picture, you want a picture? Yeah. It takes a couple minutes. Are you okay? You got a couple minutes? You got about five minutes? It takes a little, like a little time. Let's do it right over here. Like right, right in here. So you'll have to uh, hold real still. Okay. Okay. All right. So find something that's comfortable. That looks yeah. good. Yeah. Okay. Now hold real still until I say it's done. Cause uh, 
I had to focus and it takes a second. Not quite done, hold still. Hold still. Okay, three, two, all done. Okay. Do you want me to send it to you? Yeah, please. Yeah. Sometimes it just happens like that. <laughs> That's not someone I probably would have normally asked. Usually I'm looking for something like somebody doing something in the park or sitting in an interesting way or the light's interesting or there's something about them. But actually, after he posed, I was like, oh, actually, I kind of like this. So we'll see how it turns out. One of the rare times that someone like asked me for a photo. You have a favorite image that you've made uh, in this park? The first one is probably there's um, this little girl with dark hair and she's wearing this dress. She was with her dad and they were kind of by the water over there. And originally I had walked up because there was a, a man over there that I thought was interesting looking until I realized that this little girl was holding a little baby chicken, a little chick. And uh, she was just like petting it. I was like, whoa, she's got just a baby. She's holding a baby chicken. <laughs> so I asked her dad, I was like, hey, is it all right if I took a photo of her? And he was like, yeah, sure, sure. And so I took a few photos and uh, it was crazy. She like, I don't know if she's used to being in front of a camera, but she saw me point the camera at her. I asked if I could take her photo and she just like gave me this look and like showed, essentially like kind of showed me the chicken in her hands. And uh, I, I really like it. It's a, it's a nice moment. It's interesting. It's just a portrait eye that stands out in my mind. The second one that stands out is I have this photo. There's this couple sitting on a bench by the water. He was sitting behind her, kind of holding her and the light was just beautiful and I rode past them. He was like a really interesting looking guy. They were just a very interesting looking couple. The way that they were holding each other, just like something just felt magical about it. I rode past, I was too nervous to ask if I could take their photo because they were having a little moment with themselves and I was nervous, but I rode my bike past them and I came back and I said, you know, essentially, I'm so sorry, I couldn't pass up this moment. You guys look so great together. Could I please make your portrait? And he said no to having his photo taken. And she said yes, and then they kind of looked at each other. And he was really protective about it. He's like, here's the thing, you can take the photo, but you're not allowed to share it for at least a year. He's like, by then we should be married. <laughs> and I was like, okay, no problem. I'll, uh, I'll sit on it for a year. So it's, it's been a year been a year and a couple months. I still haven't shared the photo, but just an interesting moment uh, with two interesting people. And I think it came out, came out good, but that's probably the second one. So those were taken with a large format camera? No, those uh, were both taken with a Mamiya 7. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of the park work, like if, if we're showing images in this video from it, taken from all different kinds of cameras. I was using a Mamiya 7 for a little bit, a Pentax 6.7, 4x5, 8x10, and a GFX. <clears throat> I actually saw this the other day. It's a weird little thing, but I kind of want to take a photo of it. It's just those little balls on the tree. <laughs> kind of weird. I just want to see what it looks like. I don't know if I mentioned this before, but maybe you got it when you looked under the hood, but um, everything is upside down and backwards. So it's kind of a fun way to practice composition. It's kind of cool. I think that's like a metaphor for your life for it in any way. <laughs> yeah, it probably is. Hey. Artist? Yeah, photographer. Hi. I was just thinking about it walking past and we saw the colors. So this oh yeah, it's beautiful. The spot for it. It's a weird photo. It's it's really just kind of this tree with these two things kind of poking out, and I'm trying to have these in focus, which like and the water because it's kind of a solid color, gives it like a really flat background. I don't know. It's just kind of a weird little detail in the park. I don't know if you can see it. No wind. Sorry, I'm just waiting for the wind to die down. 
This is large format sometimes. I feel like it hasn't been breezy all day. You guys having a good day? Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, it's nice out. Gorgeous. Could I make a photo of you guys? Could I make a photo? Huh? I'll send it to you, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, is that okay? Yeah. Cool. Is there any way that you could scoot back just a little bit? Just so, yep. Great, right there. Uh, I'm gonna focus. You guys can just, if you hold still, it takes me a couple minutes. So hold still for like two minutes. All right, it's a long shutter, so hold real still. Uh, if you could kind of look out towards the water, right there, yep. And everyone else just hold really still. Okay, three, two, great. All done. Hi. Sorry to interrupt. I, I'm working on a. Sorry to interrupt. No worries. Uh, I'm working on a photo project in the park, taking pictures of people from behind. Your hair is like glowing. Could I take a picture of you sitting here? Is that all right? Yeah. Cool. Just keep doing what you're doing. Okay. Uh, you're, you're totally fine how you are. Okay. Thank you. All right, so the only thing I'll ask is if you just hold really still for just like two minutes. Okay. Cool. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Would you like me to send it to you? Yeah, okay, cool. So cool. You mentioned earlier that you still go out and take street photos. You're still kind of into street photography. Yeah. I think street photography is beautiful, but I also think like, even if you were not interested in street photography, I think it provides like a lot to learn from. You have to be quick. You have to see moments, you have to react. Even someone who's not interested in it should try it. But. Sorry, I think I interrupted your question. No, you're fine. <laughs> How do you split the days between today I want to go take the large format in the park and today I want to go into Midtown to shoot street photos? There's moments where I'm photographing and I like being alone. Yeah. And then there's moments where I want to be kind of surrounded by the energy of New York City and to see people like you or other friends on the street. And um, they're just two completely different types of photography. And I feel like usually if I've had like two or three days of of this I'm ready to take a little bit of a break and um, see some people so it just depends sometimes i'll come out here in the morning and then go into the city in the afternoon so i don't really know how to decide it's usually a feeling should we go do some of that now let's go all right all right <laughs> that took a while we're we're back here we just need to shoot some street it took us about Four months to get to Manhattan from Brooklyn. Yeah, whoops. <laughs> we're about 40 degrees colder. My hair's a little shorter. Look, man, honestly, we're, we're busy. Dustin's got a kid. I've got a kid, so. I got a job. Time slips away from us, and we're just gonna keep it rocking. It's winter time. We're downtown. Let's let's shoot some street. Yeah, all right. Let's do it. Everybody's favorite camera. Dustin's got the uh, Fuji X100 VI. Yeah, it's a... Uh... This will be announced later, but this is the Fuji X106, which was announced today. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, no, it's a Leica. So, yeah. Another Leica guy, sorry. Sorry. But I am borrowing a new lens, to, a new to me lens, shooting 35 today, which is very different. I, I'm normally a 28 guy. I have my 28, so maybe I'll switch later, but borrowing this for my work for now, testing it out. There's a head in there, it's a mannequin head, kind of weird. Is that your van? Yeah. I think the door's open, just oh. so you know. Yeah, yeah. Got to switch loads soon. <laughs> loads. Did I say switch loads? <laughs> switch Wait loads. a minute. Reload. I don't know. You can see how slow I am at loading my While walking too? Oh, yeah. It's gonna be a bad look. I'm asking you for directions and it's my walkie-talkie. Which way are we going? Lately though, I have really enjoyed like getting lost 
or like going to areas that I'm not familiar with instead of just midtown all the time. You think that's a product of the season or just? Um, no, I think it's just I've, I've just, a, I've been, uh, it's more exciting when it feels fresh or like new. Um, I really enjoy going to Midtown for street stuff because uh, there's a lot of people and it's a little bit more predictable. But yeah, I don't know. Lately, I've just been really enjoying going to different places that are unfamiliar. I've never been over here really to the Wall Street Bull. It's crazy. People are waiting in line to take a picture with it. That is wild. Bunch of nothing. So in the first part of this video, we talked about you taking breaks and hiatuses or stepping away from the street from time to time. What keeps you coming back to it? Uh, essentially, I just can't help myself. Um, <laughs> you know, I think it's a pretty common thing that a lot of us say that it can be very addicting. Um, it just, it's addicting. And I think even if the photos that I take aren't shared often or whatever, I, I, uh, I think it helps train your eye. I think it's good practice and it's just fun to get out. And I think that that's part of why lately I've been going to new areas. It keeps it exciting, keeps it, my mind engaged. It's, it's really hard for me to take a break from photography full stop and I just I ride the waves as they take me <laughs> I guess sometimes I'm looking for the large format look or interaction with people or subjects or whatever or slower more meditative uh, photography and sometimes I'm really looking for action and candid moments basically I just can't help I can't stop myself from doing it uh, as soon as I think I'm like over street photography or that I don't have anything that I like anymore. I'll take a break and then all of a sudden it just comes back. I gotta get out there. How are you? You look cool. I'm super not used to 35 millimeter focal length. Yeah, you typically shoot, especially on the street with a 28. Yeah. Like 90% of the time, you'd say? Oh yeah, I mean, 99, 95, 99. But I'm trying to do 35 a little bit more because it, I like the added compression. I also think that like, it looks a little bit different, like different enough that um, it's kind of exciting. What are some of the, what are some of the factors or things that you think keep pushing you away from like stepping away from this from time to time it kind of uh it's the same as what draws me back in <laughs> i guess it's the repetitive nature it's like sometimes that repetitiveness can just get a little too much um and especially when you get like a bunch of photos i mean we all know this it's 99 percent failure street photography um and sometimes I think I've just had so much failure that I want to take a break and focus on making work like with the eight by 10, that fa failure rate is lower because there's more intention and time and care put into it. So your hit rate's better. Um, and it's just using a different muscle. I think it's, it's like a creative muscle and physical <laughs> muscle. Uh, it's just nice to break it up every now and then. I don't know why I stop really. I've never stopped for very long. It's usually like a few months at a time. Sometimes weather can be a factor. I don't know. I just get drawn to making a different kind of work after a while. Nope. I missed it. I'm gonna take a lot of bad photos today, sorry. Come back, come back. All right, giving up. How's it going?
Midtown. Uh, black and white. I feel like you've been shooting a lot of black and white. What's the reasoning? You shot a lot of color before. Yeah, I haven't really shot much black and white. I've always wanted to, but I never really liked my own photos. Like I'd look at other work and uh, get really excited about black and white photos. Um, but every time I tried to use it, I didn't, didn't like it. Uh, so I just kind of forced myself to do it a little bit. Hell yeah. And when I went to that Chica review that I was talking about, um, I was, I met with one of my kind of favorite current photographers and I had shown him some black and white stuff and color stuff, but it was primarily color. And I was like, yeah, I'm thinking about switching to black and white. And, but you know, I have so much color work already. And he was like, just convert it to black and white which to me felt like sacrilegious or something. <laughs> but when he said that and he was like, you know, most of my photos, I shoot four by five film and most of my photos are black or uh, color. I convert it to black and white. And I was like, oh shit, okay. Well, if he can do it, I can do it. So I kind of went back through the archive and I started converting some color stuff to black and white. Um, I found that I actually enjoyed a lot of them. And then I just kind of challenged myself to keep shooting black and white. Been watching a lot of old movies that are in black and white that has been really inspiring. Uh, Antonioni, he has a film called La Ventura and like, it's amazing. And <laughs> it's so good. Every shot feels like it could be a photograph. Really good movie. So watching that, some movies by um, Tarkovsky, um, just a bunch of older movies that are in black and white really have been inspiring to me. So I just told myself I'm going to stick with black and white for a while. I haven't even bought color. Um, black and white kind of takes away, it abstracts in a way, and it helps you focus a little bit more in on, instead of, wow, look at the reds in that. It's like, wow, look at the emotion or look at the composition. It abstracts reality in a way that, I don't know, I find really pleasing right now. So when, when looking at photographs, people, I think like questions come up, like how do they take that? When do they take that? Why do they take that? What is, uh, what are your thoughts on like looking at photographs? What intrigues you the most? What do you look for? How do you dissect photographs? Oh man, that I'm still learning about that. Um, I think there's so much to learn about how to look at a photograph. Um, man. I guess when I'm taking photographs, I'm really trying to free myself up from asking myself any any question. It's like if it's like intuitive if if it looks interesting in the moment, if I'm drawn to it for whatever reason, I'll usually take it. I don't like to self-edit while I'm photographing, but like looking at photos, there's so much like if you're putting them in a sequence, um, I think with a lot of street photography uh, people get really like casual viewers get really interested in wow how did they get that moment how how is how are they there how did that happen um, and I find that lately I've been more interested in why like, why did that person take that photo what does it say about the photographer what what does this photo say in relation to the next photo what uh, a lot of why questions why and what unless how. I think for standalone images, how can be really uh, interesting and impactful for like, especially Instagram. Cause it's like, whoa, how the hell? But when I'm looking at photos, I'm looking at things a little bit slower these days. And yeah, like I said, asking myself more like, why? Why did this photographer make that choice? Compositionally, you can ask yourself that too. Why did they decide to leave this in or this out? What are they really trying to say with their photos? I think photography is, is really a mirror. As much as we're taking photos outward, a lot of it's reflected back. You can learn a lot about photographers and what's important to them and maybe what they're trying to say when you take a deeper look and ask more why questions. What's an example of like a why photo or sequence that you've recently come across that kind of puts you in that, in that mindset? Um, well, for instance, I, I just had, um, I'm doing a, a school thing, shout out to Penumbra. <laughs> they, uh, they do a one year long program called the LTP program, which stands for long-term project program. I'm um, using my park photos 
for that, by the end of it, I'm supposed to have made a book. That's the goal of the course. But um, I just had a meetup with one of my professors, advisors, Tim Carpenter. And he like really illuminated a lot of things for me that I wasn't thinking about with my own photographs. For example, I have a lot of photos of um, in the park where the trees are really expanding to the outer edges of the, of the frame. And they feel very, as he put it, fragmented. So like the, the whole frame feels really fragmented and not busy, but a lot going on, a lot to like, to think about when you're looking at it, like what's happening here, what's happening here. The trees are pushing to the outer edges. What does that say? Um, and then I have a lot of photos that are very inward focused. So like portraits with soft background. What does that say? How do you, what do they say in relationship to each other? If the photos are really pushed towards the edges and it feels very fragmented, what kind of, what does that make the viewer feel? Does it make them feel anxious? Like, what are you trying to say? Even, even with some of my portraits, he pointed out the viewer is going to get a different feeling if the portrait has eye contact versus not eye contact. A lot of it comes down to like, what are you trying to make the viewer experience? I'm, I'm talking more specifically in a sequence. Um, what are you trying to make the viewer experience? What kind of thing are you trying to say? And maybe it's nothing, but you have to understand that your photos will make people feel certain things um, and you're never gonna be able to get your complete point of view across because everyone's gonna interpret things differently. But making intentional decisions about how the photo feels, at least to you, I think is really important. So in, in my case, in that example, the fragmented photos versus the more singularly focused, what kind of story you're trying to say. I don't know if I have an example of my photos that I could put in the video, but um, it all comes down to I'm still learning. I think that there's still um, a lot for me to learn about how to view a photograph and what the photograph is trying to say that's outside of just the, the content of the photo. Um, learning how to read composition and how composition can affect how the viewer feels. Um, I've never really, it seems very obvious, but it's something I've just never really played with. I think coming from street photography, I'm less concerned about composition or I guess I prioritize the moment. I'm learning that it's more and more and more important for me to focus on the composition, even if it comes down to the edit. Like I don't wanna edit myself while shooting, but once looking at the photographs, I think it becomes really important to like study the composition and why things are the way they are. Cause you might have a, a great photo, maybe it's your favorite photo, but in the context of a collection of work, maybe it doesn't fit. So just asking yourself more of those questions I think is really important. What is your most recent photo book purchase? Oh, let's see. I just got this book. Damn, I don't want to mess up the name. I just bought, I think it's Nathan Pierce, High and Lonesome. Um, it's really good. I feel like I don't have enough to say about it because I haven't spent a lot of time with it, but it's the most <laughs> accurate answer to your question. It's the most recent purchase. Um, what made you pull the trigger on that book? Uh, I saw pictures of it online, uh, pictures of the photos, and I liked it. Uh, <laughs> I liked the few that I saw, and so I, I bought it. Uh, right before that, I bought the Gary Winogrand color book, the Winogrand color book, which is good. It's different. I don't know if it's my favorite Winogrand book. What did I get before that? Aaron Springer. I feel like I just have to shout her out. It's not my most recent book, but Aaron Springer. Uh, she has a book called Dormant Season, and it's fantastic. Probably my favorite photo book of 2023. Um, definitely check it out. My photo book collection has expanded so much in the last year and a half. It's crazy, so. What's, um, what's the last book that made you change the way you photograph or had some kind of impact on it? The first book that I think I got that really changed my way of thinking about photography and slowing down a little bit um, was probably Alex Soth's Sleeping by the Mississippi, which I think is like a common answer for a lot of people, but it's just so good. Trespasser, like all the Trespasser books are really good. That's a publisher. Um, Brian Scootma, uh, Matthew Genetempo. I could talk about books all day. There's so many good books.
<laughs> I'm all out of cash, sorry. The steam is crazy. Yeah. No, no, okay. He doesn't like it. Just keeps getting crazier and crazier. Sorry. That's good. Actually, I got, I think, one more. All right, that's it. I shot the last one. Yeah. I'm gonna have way too many photos of that. Might as well. I always take a bunch of photos. It's a good thing I'm shooting black and white. Sorry if there aren't any good photos. I, uh, I don't take photos all the time, but if I see something, like that steam thing, I'll, like, I'll let it rip, but then I won't take a photo for a while, so. Sorry, YouTube. Do you feel like because you've been doing this street photography thing for quite a number of years now in New York, you're kind of like a vet out here, do you feel pressure to take good photos and share good photos? I, I don't enjoy this about myself, but I do feel pressure a lot of times, but it's not really external, it's more internal. Um, you know, I have a few photos that I like, and it's, you're always wanting to like make better photos and, yeah, it's more of an internal pressure, not really external. And, and then the sharing thing, I just don't really share that much anymore anyway. Um, maybe I'll get back into sharing more. But yeah, not a, not a ton of pressure. I think primarily I do this for myself. I, I think sharing, import, sharing photos is important. It's not 100% for myself, but yeah, I try not to let any of that pressure. That doesn't bother me anymore. Uh, finish the sentence. I take photos because... I take photos because... Therapy? <laughs> I, I don't know. I have to. Therapy... They aren't gonna take themselves. Someone's gotta do it. And, uh... To borrow from Gary Winogrand... I want to see what the world looks like photographed. Woo! Alright, that's gonna do it for this episode follow-up episode of walkie talkie dustin thanks for hanging out with me again yeah thank you thank you polly for inviting me back uh it was fun to talk about stuff and i appreciate everyone that watched thank you let the people know where they can show you some love uh websites kind of under construction uh instagram i have two different accounts one's more like park style work and one is more street work uh you can check out regular dustin for street work and Dustin Roderick for everything else. Cool. All right, man. Peace. Now when they see us in the streets, all they want to do is take pics. And I'm like, okay.